Hi, today we're going to talk about environmental control systems and how we use physics to adjust the temperature of the air in the cabin. There are four basic physics principles that we use to either heat or cool the air in the cabin. Probably the most common is heat transfer. This is used in almost every system. And that's where we transfer heat energy from one surface or fluid to another. Pressure is also used, in particular the pressure of a compressible gas like air or the coolant inside of an air conditioning system. As we increase total pressure, the temperature of the gas increases. As we decrease total pressure, the temperature of the gas decreases. That's called adiabatic heating and cooling. The third tool we have is work. If we work the air with something like, say, a uh, compressor section where we're mixing and stirring and, and creating turbulence in the air, that heats the air. If we extract work from the air, if we make the air do work, like spinning a turbine or something like that, that will cool the air. We also use change of state. When substances go from a liquid to a gas or a gas to a liquid, there, that's known as a change of state. The same is true between a solid and a liquid. There's a whole bunch of energy involved in that change. And so if we can move something from a liquid to a gas, otherwise known as evaporation, that causes cooling. Evaporation is always a cooling process. The reverse is also true. If we take a gas and condense it into a liquid, that releases heat. And we use those things quite often in adjusting the temperature of our air. So let's take them one at a time. This picture shows how heat transfer can be used from one body of air to another. We have uh, perhaps a set of a uh, source of cool air flowing where the blue arrows are. And this might represent air from outside the aircraft if we're at higher altitudes. And that cold air takes energy out of that metal framework uh, so that that metal framework gets very cold. And the warmer air represented by the red arrows, it might represent cabin air, um, has heat taken out of it by that cold structure. We call that cross flow. One example of this would be uh, in the way that we heat small general aviation airplanes. We have an exhaust manifold that's quite hot, and so we create a space around the exhaust manifold, and we take outside air, run it through that space, it absorbs some heat from the exhaust manifold, and then we take that warm air into the cockpit to warm our feet. Here's a bleed air conditioning off of a Lear 31A. The, the air coming off of the compressors, which is bleed air, is quite hot. And so we need to cool that down using outside air that is very, very cold. We use that through a heat exchanger, which is an example of heat transfer. Another place we use it is in combustion heaters. This combustion heater is just like the one in a Piper Seminole. We create a little fire inside this by burning some gasoline. Um, and then, and that heats a shroud around the combustion chamber. And we create a space outside of that where the cabin air can absorb some of that heat and transfer it into the cabin with us. This is a diagram of a combustion heater. Now, obviously, if we're going to mix gasoline with air and light it and keep it burning, that's a potentially dangerous situation. Um, that part of this system is represented by the green flow of air. We take combustion air in from outside, mix it with the fuel, um, which is burning, 
uh, and then the exhaust exits overboard. That warms the shroud around the combustion chamber. And then we bring in outside air, which is represented by yellow, and we run that over the combustion chamber to warm it up as it goes into the cabin. Note that we can get that air either from outside using a scoop during flight, or we can use it getting air from a uh, ventilating fan uh, when we're not flying. And there's a little gate that controls that flow of air so that we can guarantee ourselves that we're getting a flow of air across that combustion chamber. If we don't have that, the combustion chamber can overheat and warp or crack, which then that can lead to carbon monoxide leaks into our cabin. So there's all sorts of safeguards on here, pressure switches, temperature sensors, and so forth, so that if anything starts to go wrong, the unit will shut off automatically. If you're going to use one of these in the aircraft, it's really important that you understand exactly how your unit works. As you get into larger aircraft, in particular turbine aircraft, you'll start to encounter air cycle machines, and they are quite simple. In this diagram, you'll see that the bleed air is coming off of the engine that's represented by red. It's quite hot. It has to go through a heat exchanger to cool it down. The heat, ex heat exchanger is cooled by outside air, the cooling air. And that air is helped through by the little fan down by arrow B. After the bleed air has gone through the heat exchanger, look for the orange lines, it goes down into a turbine and it drives that turbine. The turbine is what drives the fan. So what we're doing here is we're making the cabin air do some work and that work causes the cabin air to cool down a little bit. We're taking energy out of it in order to run that turbine. That results in some pretty cold air because that outside air is very, very cold. Uh, and so we have a bypass line down with a little valve labeled warm air that we can open up to warm the air back up again if it's too cold for our cabin. Here we have a two-wheel system, and you can see we get ram cooling air or cooling air from a fan for this one. It goes through two heat exchangers. The primary one is actually the second one that the, that the cooling air encounters. That's where the bleed air goes in. So if you look for the bleed air, it goes into the primary heat exchanger and gets cooled down. Then it goes through a turbine wheel, um, which then go, warms it back up. The turbine compresses that air and warms it back up a little bit so that then it can be cooled again in the secondary heat exchanger. Um, it then gets fed into the turbine, which cools it down again and goes into the cabin. And once again, we have a mixer valve where we can remix warm air with it if that air is too cold. They can get more and more complex adding wheels to the system, and, but the basic principle is the same in each case. The advantage of these air cycle machines is that they can handle a lot of cabin air, so a high flow, high volume of air. They, but they are very light and they don't involve a bunch of fluids that have to be serviced. The individual system varies from one aircraft model to another, and you need to be familiar with whatever system is on your particular model of aircraft so that you understand what the failure modes are and what the, you can do about them. Another type of air conditioning system is the vapor cycle system. This is the type of system that you have on your car or if you have air conditioning in your house, it uses this type of system. It uses evaporation. So this is an example of a change of state system. So it uses evaporation of a coolant 
that has a very low boiling point. As it evaporates, it cools and we can use a heat exchanger to cool the cabin air. When it condenses again into a liquid, that releases a bunch of heat. And so we put another heat exchanger outside the cabin uh, in the engine compartment or in the belly of the aircraft uh, and release the heat overboard. Essentially what we're doing is we're soaking up heat from inside and exhausting it overboard outside and we're using the coolant to move it from one place to another. This is a diagram of a vapor cycle cooling system and we're going to take it through one step at a time starting with the pump which is in the lower left hand corner of this diagram. The pump compresses the coolant when it is in its gaseous form. It's extremely important actually that the coolant be in the gaseous form. If it happens to get any liquid form in there, it will break the pump. But usually it arrives there as a gas and we compress it. That heats the coolant and then we send the coolant into the condenser, which is outside of the cabin. In the example of your car, it's usually up in the engine compartment with the radiator. It runs through that heat exchanger, and because it, the heat exchanger is removing a bunch of heat, it cools the coolant enough so that the coolant condenses back into a liquid, and that releases a bunch of heat. Then we run through a dryer, a coolant dryer, and what the dryer does is it removes any water that might be mixed with the system. It's very important that this system stay closed to the outside environment, but there's a little bit of moisture that gets trapped with it when you assemble the system to begin with, and the dryer is there to take any moisture out that might be present. We then allow the coolant to enter a part of the system that is at a much lower pressure and that causes the coolant to evaporate. And it does that in the evaporator. Evaporation is a cooling process and so the evaporator gets very, very cold. We run the cabin air over the evaporator and that's what gives us the cold air inside the cabin. Once we're done with that, we've, the coolant at that part is completely turned back into a vapor, and so it goes back to the pump to be compressed again, run through the condenser, and the whole thing starts again. It is a closed loop. There's a couple things that can go wrong with this. One is that ice can build up on the evaporator because it's so cold and so the cabin air that's running over the evaporator has moisture in it and so frost forms on the evaporator and then that blocks the airflow. So it has to have a temperature sensor on it to keep it from getting too cold and then it would shut the pump off and let the evaporator warm back up slightly before restarting. There's a figure of a vapor cycle system from a Cessna Mustang in your textbook. I encourage you to see if you can follow that cycle through. Uh, and find the evaporator and the condenser and puzzle through how the different air flows work and how the coolant flows through this system. So the five things for these systems are what is it? How, how does your system control the temperature of the cabin air? How does it work? How does it fail? And so that can be everything from exhaust leaks to pack failures. Pack, by the way, is what they call the air cycle units in a lot of aircraft. Control system failures, blocked air supplies, iced over evaporators. You need to investigate how your particular system can fail. And then you need to know how that's going to be indicated in the cockpit. In a lot of cases, it's just the simple fact that the air coming out when you turn on the air conditioning is still warm, or the air coming out when you turn on the heater is still cold, and that's the only indication you get. Other times, you'll get a warning light, 
if uh, critical airflow has been disrupted. And what do you do next? There are usually procedures to shut off, isolate, bypass, or otherwise mitigate the risks that might be imposed by a system failure. Usually these things can be addressed by using a checklist rather than memory items. 